Welcome to another how-to video in Onshape. Uh, for this video, we're going to go through one of the parts for the mass property analysis activity. I'm going to start off by creating a new folder to put all of my parts in. I'll go ahead and activate that folder by clicking on it, and we're ready to start our first empty document. I'm going to go ahead and work on the slotted angle block. Okay, as you're working on the mass properties parts, I encourage you to do it subtractively. Create a raw stock block that's your full height, width, and depth, and then put all your features into that. So I'm going to go ahead and start a new sketch on the front view. I'll go ahead and change my alignment so I can look straight onto it. And I'm going to use a rectangle to start off my raw stock. So I can see that I have 5 and 1 eighth of an inch wide. I have one and three quarters tall. That's the only two that I really care about now. So I'm going to go ahead and place my rectangle off of the origin and somewhere out here. I can see that I have a white box around this bottom dimension, so that's going to be my 5.125, and I'm going to hit enter. And then I'll jump over to the other box where I can type in 1.75. Great, everything should be black and fully constrained. I'll go ahead and finish the sketch and put myself back into isometric. I am also going to go ahead and turn off the origin and my original three work planes. Okay, we're going to go ahead and do an extrusion now. I'll pick my shape and I want an overall depth of two and three quarters of an inch. So a blind depth of two and three quarters. I'll hit enter to be able to view it and if I'm happy with it then I can go ahead and accept that extrusion. Awesome. The rest of it, you kind of have to decide on your own where you want to go from here. Uh, I would like to do this slot. And I have the choice of either doing it on the top and cutting it down, or I can do it on this right side and cut it across. If it's done on the top, then I'm going to have a blind dimension that cuts it down. If I do it on the right side, then I'm going to be sending it all the way through the part. And that's usually how I do most of my cuts. That's the view that I like to do it in. So I am going to do a new sketch on my right-hand side. I'll go ahead and straighten it up. And I'm going to go ahead and draw a rectangle. Now this rectangle, the only thing I want to do is create a coincidence up here on the top line and then come down here somewhere. Okay, I know that it is 0.625 wide and I know that it is three quarters of an inch tall. The only other thing that I know is that it's centered from side to side and I really don't feel like doing the math to try to center this thing from side to side. So I want to show you a couple of tricks. In a lot of software packages, I can just use the vertical constraint. And I can lock the midpoint of this rectangle vertically to the midpoint of this one. And I can actually highlight that one, um, but for some reason I can't this one. And it's the same thing when I grab the vertical tool. I can't find midpoints. Um, so I got a couple little tricks to be able to make that happen. I'm going to use the point tool. And I'm just going to put a point in the middle of this one and the middle of this one. Now those points will always be in the middle, so I kind of wish they were there originally that I could find with a vertical tool. Uh, and for some reason it just doesn't find them. So I can do that and I can make those two points always vertical to each other. And now the whole thing is black and it's good to go. Another option is to just use the line tool. So I can use the line tool. I can find the middle of that one pretty easy. I can find the middle of this one pretty easy. Escape my line and now I can just make that line vertical. Either way. I will encourage you, if you're going to use this line, is to go ahead and right-click on it and turn it into a construction line um, because it's just there to go ahead and hold the part. So either way, we need to go ahead and get this square completely black. Sweet. I'll go ahead and finish the sketch, put an isometric, extrude, pick my small square, and make sure that it is on remove. Okay, so the distance, how much? I'm going to change it from blind to through all. That's the one that I like because um, no matter how big the part gets, it will always go through all. Awesome. So the only thing we have left is the chamfers or the angles. And I could do them as angles. I could do a new sketch on here and draw some angles and cut them across. And the same thing on the right-hand side. But the chamfer tool is really going to help me out pretty good. Um, I just need to know the sizes of them. And that it doesn't tell me. So I kind of have to interpret the part a little bit. Um, I can see that I have a smaller chamfer on the front and back. How do I know what's smaller? Um, because it doesn't reach as far down as the one that's on the left and right. So now I need to do a little bit of math. 
if this is one inch to one of the chamfers and the whole thing is one and three quarters tall, then one of my chamfers is going to be three quarters, whatever's left. It's gonna be the same thing with this one. This one's three quarters. The entire part is one and three quarters, so one of my chamfers is gonna be one. All right, so if I know I have two different chamfers, one and the three quarters, then I need to know which one is which. Remember, we already said that the small one is on the front and back, and the bigger one or the farther one down is on the right and left. So chamfer, front and back, and I'll type in the three quarters, that's the smaller one, and hit enter to view it. You should notice now that you have this small, the same line proportionately to you do in the drawing itself. If you had accidentally said that this was the one and hit enter, you would see that that line is really, really small. So the 0.75 is the correct one. I'll go ahead and accept that chamfer and then we'll do the other one. So if that's the 0.75, then the one on both of these ends must be the one. And there we go. So it creates the same intersection that we have over on this part. Okay, so we've got everything we need except for we've not identified this as mild steel. So I'm gonna come down here to the part that's labeled down here at the bottom and I'm going to right click it. I'm then gonna go to assign material and I'm gonna use the on shape library. I'm gonna come here to none and I'm gonna change that to my mild steel. Well, there's not actually a mild, if I type in mild, that's not labeled out in the on shape library, but we have different steels. So the steel that I want to find is the one that just says steel. So we have a bunch of stainless steels, and there we go. We have one that's just plain steel, and that'll work for what we need. Okay, so I've modeled the parts. I have identified it as mild steel, and the last thing I need to do is identify the mass properties. I need to look at the weight, I need to look at the volume, I need to look at the surface area. So once I've assigned it as a material, I'm going to come down here to the scale to display my mass properties. When I open that up, it should automatically have everything that it needs. I've got my mass, I've got my volume, and I've got my surface area. Okay, so now that we have our material set up, we've checked our mass properties, I want to show you why it was so important in the very beginning that I made it out of raw stock. And it's this bar right here called the rollback bar. So I can actually grab that bar and I can roll it back through the part as if I had never done it. So I can go all the way back to the beginning on when it was just one solid chunk and I can compare the mass properties here as my own steel. I can look at those mass properties and then I can compare them to what it is as a finished part. That way I can evaluate how much material I have lost in volume and in weight. So there you go. And that's all there is to being able to do the slotted angle block.